Warning, I have used FL Studios for 12 years straight, and I'm only just realizing it's called Sound Goodizer, not Sound Gooderizer, until after I recorded all of the audio. So I will be calling it the wrong name throughout this entire video. Enjoy that. I saw a video the other day that went a little something like this, 10 Sound Gooderizers on the Master Channel. This video is great because he uses it to craft loops, and you get to hear how it could be used practically for sound design situations. I have two problems with it, though. One, there's just not that many plugins running here. And two, he didn't follow his own advice. There's never enough. I mean, it's a good dessert, so you can always make it better, you know? His work could have sounded even gooder. It's tragic, really. And that's when I saw this video, using 100 sound gooderizers on a single track. I love this video. Using mixer presets is great, but the oversight here is the way the synth is routed through their mixer. When you route a sound source through multiple channels at the same time, you're also duplicating the synth sound as well. So what ends up happening is that he's getting additional doubles of the synth for every mixer track that it's routed to. All of them are gooderized by 10 right off the bat, but then each additional iteration gets 10 more because they are routed back to the master channel. It's like you have one synth player whose signal is running through a huge amplifier, and then that amplifier's output is sent to 99 other synth players, all playing the exact same note, and they're all running through to another huge amplifier. Now, they didn't do anything wrong, it's still very successful, and you get a lot more presence of the synth in the final product. The way the synths are set up is a technique called parallel processing, which means the same sound is being sent to more than one track, while the secondary track typically have a fully wet or turned on effects, especially things like reverb or vocal and synth doubles. What we saw in the 10 Sound Gooderizers video is what we call serial processing, which means the sound runs through one FX plugin at a time, in order from first to last in the effects chain. Aside from that, he also didn't maximize his sound goodingness, which is just a total bummer. But then, I saw this video, 10,000 sound gooderizers versus one song, and I'm very intrigued. This is definitely quite a feat of dedication to behold. It was achieved in an efficient way, and he was the first person I saw to maximize their sound goodness levels as well. And since this beautiful human being turned that dial all the way up, you know it's gotta sound good, right? Okay, maybe it sounds really bad, but this is done with serial processing, or in series, and we're getting a good representation for the most part. For the most part. The method is to fill up the mixer with 1,000 sound gooderizers, 10 plugins on 100 mixer tracks, and then he exports the track, routes it to the new audio input, and then repeats the cycle. To understand why this is a slight problem, let's consider how audio rendering works. When you render, balance, or freeze a track, they're all literally the same thing, you create a file that is a bunch of individual instructions that tell your speakers how to vibrate to reproduce your audio file's data. It's almost like painting in a way. When you're making music, it's like you're painting with multiple layers of wet paint, everything blends together, making mixtures of colors and allows for very manual forms of blending. But what's happening in the video is each time he renders the track, it's like the paint is dried, and then the picture is finalized. Anything you were to paint on top of that it would be unchanged by its previous layers. Now, he provides a glimpse into the rendering settings, of which there's three main considerations. One is the file type and bit depth. MP3 files are designed to trim off unnecessary audio data to save on file space, while minimizing any audible changes to the sound of the file. And a bit depth is just how many times the audio refers to the original source material to then determine how accurately your speakers reproduce the original audio file. WAV files, however, is what we call a lossless format, meaning that the data of the original software that has the sound will not be lost in the rendering process. The second is the resampling method. The resampling method determines the final resolution of your output. Think of it like this. Imagine your DAW software as the director of a movie, and all of your plugins are the actors in that film. In this metaphor, the sample rate is like the film inside of the camera shooting it all. The more frames there are on the film reel or digital camera's recording, you'll get a much higher quality result. And this is where we hit our first snag. Resampling just isn't perfect, even on the highest settings. This is a process of mathematically converting raw data points into either more or less new points, which is called upsampling and downsampling respectively. 
Both of these use approximation, and even though it's designed to be absolutely minimal, when we're talking about rendering the same track multiple times, this effect does stack up and can cause digital artifacting. When you're downsampling or converting from a higher to lower sample rate, you can run into a special type of distortion called aliasing. For an example, have you ever seen videos of helicopters flying where the blades are moving so fast that they look like they're actually moving backwards or they're completely still? This happens when the blades are moving faster than the camera's capturing the footage, and this is similar to what aliasing is in an audio sense. There's something called the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, which simplified, states that to recreate a continuous sound wave using samples like snapshots of the audio, the amount of individual audio samples you need must be greater than two times the highest frequency contained in that sound wave, and only works if the frequency band is below that frequency. Take CDs, for example. They are ancient relics estimated to have been roaming the earth somewhere between the 90s and the late 2000s period. Despite how archaic these artifacts may be, they were made with a high sample rate of 44.1 kHz, or 44,100 snapshots per second. And this number wasn't chosen arbitrarily. If we divide that by 2, we'll get 22.5 kHz, or 22,500 samples. If we take a look at the spectrum of human hearing, we can see that the rough maximum is around 20 kilohertz. And this is exactly why it was chosen in the first place. Keep in mind that the sample rate is how many snapshots of audio there are in a file, and the Nyquist frequency is a singular point in the audio file's frequency band, representing the highest frequency that resampling processing can accurately recreate. But what happens if there is audio data above the Nyquist frequency? It will be oscillating up and down at such a high speed in the frequency band that the computer will have no choice but to do the best that it can, and the result will be as if the original sound has a false identity, or alias, which results in frequencies literally folding back into the rest of the frequency band. For example, imagine if we're trying to render a pure sine wave that plays at 48 kilohertz, which is way above the Nyquist frequency by exactly 29.95 kilohertz. If we subtract this extra frequency of 29.95 kilohertz from the Nyquist frequency of 22.5 kilohertz, then our result will represent an alias frequency of negative 7.45 kilohertz. Now, outside of hippie circles, there's no such thing as negative frequencies. So if we ignore the negative sign, we are left with the unwanted alias frequency that's going to be generated, 7.45 kilohertz. This is smack dab in the middle of our treble frequencies. Since sound goodizer is heavily increasing all frequencies, this effect increases more. Each resampling method has their own algorithm for anti-aliasing, the higher point sync options costing increased CPU usage, so they definitely used the best option here. But the multiple renderings do lead to a less accurate result of what 10,000 sound goderizers would actually sound like. And three, beyond that, multiple renders also open up the final product to something called quantization errors. Even though audio is represented as a waveform to a computer, they are all just a bunch of numbers that go from point to point. And because we're talking about approximation, the software is limited to how exact the render can be to its output. Most DAWs have an option to add something called dithering to the final render, which is a very quiet, specifically designed noise signal, which masks these imperfections in the rendering process. It's shaped to be more prominent in frequencies our ears are less sensitive in. Since they're rendering in the highest settings possible, the amount of this is so minimal that it doesn't really even allow you to turn it on. If they did have it on for all 10 renders, however, it would definitely contribute to the signal's inaccuracy further. But when it's all said and done, they did a great job at controlling as many variables as possible. But with multiple stages of rendering, these extra problems get in the way. So not only do I want to try and see if I can get to 10,000 of these bad boys hooked up in series, I want to try and stretch that number as far as possible. To 1 million. Which could either be barely impossible or is just totally and utterly impossible for the software we have available to use in this day and age. But that's not going to stop me from trying. But Morgan, you're probably wondering, there's only 125 mixer tracks in FL Studios, right? And there's only 10 FX slots for each plugin. How could you possibly fit that many in there? Well, that part is actually fairly simple. We just need to use this absolutely wild FL Studios plugin called Patcher. When you open it up, it gives you a blank slate with an input and an output to FL Studios. If you right click into the gray space, you can add a plugin, which you can then drag from the input of FL to the plugin and then route the output of the plugin back into FL. 
But the neat thing about this tool is you can cram as many plugins as you want in there. Furthermore, you can run the signals in parallel to multiple plugins before it is routed out back into FL Studios, all in a single effects slot on the mixer. The only real limit to how many plugins that can be loaded depends on your computer's hardware and FL Studios software limitations. So here we go, I guess. And for this experiment, we're going to be using the default FL kick drum. But let's do the math really quick, though. With 125 total channels available in FL Studios, each one has 10 effect slots. 1 million plugins divided by 125 mixer tracks means that we need to put 8,000 plugins on each mixer track. 8,000 plugins divided by 10 mixer slots means that each patcher plugin needs 800 sound good editors in it. So that's actually not that impossible. Let's try starting with 20 sound good risers. We still have a long way to go. Let's double that to 40. And of course, I've completely forgotten to maximize the goodness levels, so uh, let's fix that here. Okay, 40 good boys. Let's go. Wild. Double or nothing. I feel the power of good coursing through my veins. While I'm beginning to question the naming convention around Sound Goodizer at this point, we're starting to eat up a lot of CPU. That sounds like a problem for future Morgan, if you ask me, though. But yeah. It's really crazy how the power of editing can make you forget how mind-numbing this process actually is. You know, I think they should just rename the program to Sounds Better Riser when applied 160 times in a row, or Riser. It can really only sound better with 320, obviously. Wait a hot second. Can I just copy and paste these plugins into Patcher?
You have no idea how much easier this would make my life right now. Oh. All right. What the actual fuck? This was such a great idea. I feel like I'm contributing so much to society right now. Let's celebrate that fact by getting the hardest part out of the way next. 640 sound good arisers in one preset. Does that sound good with you? Also, so you get a good grasp of how long this next part really is, the total runtime of the videos I'm watching to keep myself sane through this mundane task is over one and a half hours long worth of content. Just to put that in perspective. <laughs> Okay, the nightmare's over now. Until we listen to what it sounds like.
we still have 160 extra layers of good rising left to add to this patch or preset. But we're at least we're in the home stretch now. 800 instances. Let's go. <laughs> taste. Sounds good. <laughs> Who would have guessed? So now that we have 800 presets going in one patcher, let's save it as a preset. You can do this by clicking patcher in the chain and click save and create a name for your preset. Then if you want to load it, you can click and load from there or click on the name in the preset in the top right of the patcher window and it should just be the first one in the selection. Now all we need to do is load this 1,250 times. But also not really. We can open up the instances of the 800 sound goodizers in all 10 effects slot on a mixer track. And if we right click on the mixer track, then we can save mixer preset as and create a preset for the mixer track itself. Meaning I would only need to load this preset into each of the 125 tracks. And our goal of 1 million sound goodizers will be totally accomplished. Good God, well, that's disheartening. And it definitely didn't seem to be a fluke, because after numerous attempts, I was completely out of ideas. What happened here? I have no idea. FL's debug console had no idea. Windows Event Viewer had no idea. Google had no idea. Even AI had no idea. So there was literally only one thing left to try. Make an overly detailed form post to the FL Studios message board explaining my issue and the off chance that it was something on my end. 
I was also hopeful that the newer FL Studio's function called Smart Disabling would come into play here, which turns off plugins that don't have audio playing through them, even if they are enabled to be turned on in the mixer. The theory was that if I could get them all loaded into the software, I could take advantage of the Smart Disable feature to prevent FL from crashing. And if I was just patient with it for long enough, it would process each sample of audio to render through each sound goodizer instance just very slowly. A user responded saying that even if the plugins are disabled, they will still be using some amount of memory, which tells me Smart Disable may not be as useful as I was hoping for. They brought up a good point that there's really no way to tell how much RAM each instance of the plugin is using, or how much excess data is required from things like routing large amounts of plugins in FL Studios in Patcher. It was very likely the computer was running out of memory, until I started monitoring the memory. My computer's max RAM usage with a blank FL Studios project is about 9.2 gigabytes of RAM total. Opening up 800 sound goodizers and Patcher brought it up to 10.3 gigabytes. Attempting to open up another 800 would bring it to 10.6, then crash. I have 16 gigabytes of RAM. So what the hell? That means that even theoretically, if each of the 800 sound goodizers only used 1.1 gigabytes of RAM, I should still at least be able to open five times as many as I have currently. So what's good, FL Studios? Let me have more plugins, maybe? And let's get this out of the way right now. We have to run 1,250 instances of Patcher total. Assuming that the 1.1 gigabyte raise is solely by Patcher and Sound Goodarizers alone, that would mean I need roughly 1,250 gigabytes to run this Lovecraftian nightmare of an idea without crashing the software. This is likely the same crossroads that the 10,000 Sound Goodarizers video ran into, ultimately deciding to spend ages rebouncing the audio to get its final result. I would happily upgrade my RAM as much as possible if that were the issue, but it seems like there's some kind of software limitation in FL Studios that I can't really tell. Then something amazing happened. Someone asked me why with four exclamation points. Okay, but something really amazing happened. Someone thought I was rich. I felt truly honored, and they also shared a great deal of support towards my cause. Okay, but the, uh, something actually amazing happened. Someone responded saying that they just tested a thousand sound goodizers and ran into the same issue when they were trying to add more than that. But the crazy part is that he was able to open 3,000 instances of parametric EQ in a single patcher. This blew my mind even further, because that means that it doesn't seem to be a plugin count limit, since they were able to open three times as many instances of a single plugin. That seems way more complex than this single knob compressor. So again, what is good FL Studios? In the message, they mentioned the strange government agency, GDI, that I've never heard of before, and expressed that they were limited to 10 plugins with three zeros after a decimal point, but I couldn't quite make sense of how this was relevant to any issue, as I am not a government agency. I, I tried calling various other agencies, the police, FBI, CIA, NSA, Burger King, White Castle... And Sting told me to never call this number again, and Nintendo told me not to discuss two of them. The NSA already knew why I was calling, and Burger King and White Castle both insisted that they were a Wendy's to try to get out of the conversation. I was at a loss. Until I realized I'm an idiot. Other countries use decimal points instead of commas, and that GDI was not a governing body. Oh, also, and that this mad lad who jumped into the fray with me was actually an image line technical support employee. He responds by mentioning that Windows has a GDI limit of 10,000. But what does that mean? GDI is short for Graphic Device Interface. It's essentially a way for applications running on older Windows hardware to display graphics in formatted text. The thing is, a sound goodizer takes up more than one GDI. It uses 9 per. So 10,000 divided by 9 is 1,111, which is pretty much the exact same range I was getting caught up in. This means that Windows has no more available resources to offer FL Studios, and theoretically, simply just shouldn't generate the graphics for the plugin. However, when a GDI error occurs, every program can be coded to handle it differently. While I can't confirm exactly how FL Studio works, they seem to have coded it in such a way that if the plugin can't get the GDI resources to load the graphics, it will close FL Studios entirely, maybe thinking it's another bug, or to prevent anything catastrophic from happening to the computer in the first place.
This is all fairly new to me, but from researching a bit, I learned that the GDI is pretty outdated technology. For example, GDI has been a core part of Windows since the very first version of Windows, but since there's no documentation, it's estimated that this system could offer somewhere between dozens to hundreds of GDI resources. Windows XP was only able to offer 10,000 resources per an entire computer session at one time. Windows Vista was able to upgrade this to 10,000 GDI resources per process, which is a pretty exponential leap, if you ask me. And between these two, FL Studios was in the early stages of being born and growing as a software. During this time, GDI Plus was made, which had way more features, but still used GDI objects, so it was fairly similar. And that's where we come to more modern times, where Direct 2D and Direct Write eventually came along which allows for graphical computing to take place away from the CPU and on a GPU. This replaces the idea with something called graphical objects, with almost a web of different resources to output a final product, such as contexts, brushes, geometries, bitmaps, layers, and text formats. So, are we dead in the water? Actually, no, not yet. Something else I didn't understand from this post that he mentioned was this phrase. I extended it to 100,000 but it still crashes. Edit. Limit should be set at 65.536, not 100,000, and they will test that. I was floored again, because apparently there was a way to tell Windows to change the limit? While Windows sets the default to 10,000 GDI handles per process, certain applications may need more than this, and it can be changed at will to accommodate that. But the technical limit to 65,536 is due to how in Windows GDI handles are assigned a value, and in the code for the operating system is defined with a 16-bit integer. Now we're going to go down one more tiny rabbit hole. Bits are related to binary counting, which uses zeros and ones to count up. The computer uses electricity and components to simulate and calculate in binary. When you're designing different parts of an operating system, you need to tell it how many binary numbers a certain component will need before it uses it. So a 1-bit integer would have two numbers, 0 and 1. A 2-bit integer would have 4, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. A 16-bit integer would have... 65,536. And this is most likely why we're seeing that limitation here, simply because Windows has assigned that number, for whatever reason may exist. By updating the Windows registry key and executing this code in a notepad, we can update that pesky 10,000 GDI per process limit up to 65,536, which definitely doesn't put us in the millions, but it's a major step forward. If it actually worked. The last part of this message was that they did extend it to 100,000, but they would still crash shortly over that same limit. The last interesting detail from this was another user who was very helpful in think tanking all this. But this person shared they were able to get way above 10,000 instances going. But at 70% CPU usage and 39 gigs of RAM being used at the same time, it just didn't seem safe to continue from there. Since Mac computers manage system resources differently, it doesn't even have a concept equivalent to the Windows GDI objects, meaning that there was no GDI limit to get in our way. So where does that leave us? The image line employee was intrigued enough to ask some questions to the developers, but given that this is under the premise of the most smooth brain chain in existence, I would be understanding if figuring this out doesn't land high on their priority list. It'll probably be a while before any response if we get one. So, did I clickbait you into watching this video? I guess we'll find out. Because at this point, 1 million sound good answers simultaneously is just not possible. FL Studios would need to fundamentally change how it handles graphical objects to do so, which I'm not certain about, but likely means they would have to do the same for both their Windows and their Mac versions of the native FL plugins as well, which would be an insanely daunting task to do, requiring recoding of entire architectures, a new round of debugging, ultimately for something that the user may not even notice or ever encounter in the long run. GDI is also very simple and it has a wide support from Windows XP and higher, it's very reliable, and it allows for older software to work without much complication. There's really no viable reason for them to move over to a direct 2D environment as a business, period. You know, all of a sudden, I'm not feeling like as much of a hater of the rendering methods mentioned in the beginning of this video. When I'm crouching, I can walk like this. Okay, so this is going to take a while. Let's skip ahead to what it actually sounds like.
Moving along, we're going to do 2,650 sound goodizers. Also, enjoy this time lapse of how long each export will take. <laughs> So now we only need to do this, um, let's see, 100,000 sound good arisers divided by 1,280 per export means I'm going to have to do this 78 more times. Each export takes 54 minutes and divide that by 60, which is 70.3 hours of time. I'm not getting back here. And also, because these are getting so much longer, I'm going to skip through it just to play some more of the interesting parts of the export. I could have been studying, I could have been cleaning my room, I could have been doing literally anything else, but... It ain't much, but it's honest work. Or maybe it's a lot of work and it's stupid work. I don't really know, to be honest. Who needs a decent social life when you can just take a mediocre social life and just do this to it? Sound sounds good, good sound sounds good, good sound sounds good, good sound sounds. And now after eight days straight of exporting later, I present to you 101,120 sound goodizers.
So that took me over a week to do, which means I would need to do this for roughly three months every day if I wanted to reach one million, which I just simply don't have the time to do. And that's pretty disheartening to realize. I racked my brain for a solution, but it just seemed absolutely impossible to reach the original goal. And then I realized something. The answer was right in front of my eyes the entire time. What if I turned on every single export that I had made? And I mean every export. And then exported that. So wait a second. How many sound good arisers is this behemoth exactly? To find the answer to that, we would have to find the sum of an arithmetic series, which the formula looks a little something like this. Which in our situation is something like 1,280 plus 1,280 times 2 plus 1,280 times 3, all the way up until 1,280 times 79. I'm not going to waste your time with that. The answer is it's 4,044,800 sound gooderizers. And that's pretty much it. If you guys would like to download any of these for your own personal usage, I put a link in the description. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to see me torture myself through more experiments in the future, click the subscribe button, and I'll see you on the next adventure.